I'm getting the thumbs up. I guess that means it's time to start. So I guess we'll start since the bosses in the in the back have said to start. So everybody ha do what? Oh, that's right. Lights, camera, not much action from up here. Yeah. Uh, everybody have a good week. Sort of. Sort of. Yes. Yes. Sort of. Do anybody say no? Do I have a no? Do what? We are blessed. Okay, blessed. All right, nobody's going <laughs> to... That's right, we've had everything this week. Is anybody going to admit to not having a good week? Good, I didn't want to hear it anyway. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, thanks for noticing, finally. <laughs> Oh, let's bow our heads and have prayer because this outfit needs prayer this morning, I can tell already. <laughs> Father in heaven, we're thankful, dear Lord, for this Sabbath day that's come so that we can gather together to study your word. And we just ask for the Holy Spirit to be here with us as we go over this. And we just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now, this week we have finally gotten through the part of Daniel that nobody's interested in, right? We got through the first six chapters and nobody was interested in any of that, right? Now we're getting to the good stuff. Right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the attitude we have if we're not careful because, you know, we, Daniel's the book of prophecy, right? We want to get to the good stuff. We don't want to mess with all that, you know, relationship stuff. Who needs that? We want the animals. Yeah, we want the animals. But you know, God put uh, Daniel in the order which he is with a purpose. That's right. He wants us to understand Him. He wants us to have that connection which Daniel had with, with God. Because then you understand the prophecies. Many times we want to focus on the prophecy and we miss the ball because we don't have that connection with Jesus. Exactly. The first six chapters of Daniel taught what? What was, what was the one thing? Relationship with God. Yes, God cares and He's yes. with you and He... Yes. He wants to be with you, mm -hmm. right? He was, he was chasing Nebuchadnezzar the whole time. <laughs> you know, it took him forever to get him. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, that's, what it's important for us. that's why there's those first six chapters before we get to this, is because we have to understand what we have to, how we have to be with God first before we start jumping into to all this. Otherwise, we're going to miss this. It's not going to make any sense. Okay. Now that we've got that out of the way, what is the good stuff? What is Daniel chapter 7 about? What does it start with? Prophecy. Prophecy. Uh, and remember we started this quarter. What kind of prophecy is it? Do y'all remember? The vision of the four beasts. Okay. The four beasts. Future. Okay, now, what I, what I meant for you to say, there was two kinds of prophecy, remember? There's a classical prophecy, and then there was something else. I can't remember what it was. Right? There's, a, there's the prophecy that involves time, right? We studied that. But then there's, pro there's the conditional prophecy that God gave, like, all through the Old Testament, that... If you do this, this will happen. If you don't do that, something else will happen, right? This part of, the, of Daniel is the classical kind. It's the kind that deals with time. It deals with the future. It deals with the end of time. Apocalyptic prophecy. prophecy. There you go. Yeah. So that's what Daniel chapter 7 is starting here. And what is the vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 7? What's the Cliff Notes version? Four beasts. Four beasts. Okay. Now, what are these beasts? Kingdoms. Kingdoms. Okay. What was the first beast? Okay, it was a lion with wings. Okay, good. Okay. 
we'll get, we'll get to what, they, what they mean here in a minute. What was the next beast? Okay, we had a lion with, with wings on its back. That was the first one. What was the second one? A bear. And what's, what's weird about the bear? See, all of these animals are weird. Okay? Okay, he was lopsided. And he had three ribs in his mouth, okay? What came after the bear? He liked his ribs. Yeah, who doesn't like ribs, right? The leopard. Oh, just a leopard? Yeah, a weird mutant leopard. Four, le four heads and four wings. Okay, and then what came after the leopard? Something weird. Yeah, something really weird. What kind of beast was it? What does Daniel say it was? Yeah. He, he can't even describe it. I mean, all the others are weird, but at least they looked like familiar animals. This one, he's just like, there's no way I can describe this. It's just, it's a monster. Iron teeth, though. Yeah, it's a monster. It has iron teeth. It has bronze claws. And, well, it's just, don't take my word for it. What does it say here? Let's see. Oh, that's not what I want. Okay, it has ten horns. What else? Okay, it has eyes. It was different from all the other beasts that came before it. Okay, it was distinct. Okay, it's like a human eyes. Okay, it has the eyes of a man. Okay, that's important. What else? A mouth that what? Okay, it's a mouth that was speaking boastful things. Okay, good. What else? Far more cruel and rapacious. rapacious. Yeah, rapacious. Some of the versions say that rapacious means hungry, like starving. When you when you've come in after working in the field all day and you haven't had anything to eat, you will be rapacious. You will eat anything that you can get your hands on. So that's what this means. It, it means it wasn't just eating stuff. It was stuffing it in its mouth as fast as it can. Famished. Famished. Yeah. He had an attitude problem. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Okay, three of the first horns got pulled out when this little horn showed up. Okay, good. Now, we have four beasts. Now let's, what do these four beasts represent? What does the first beast represent? Babylon. Babylon. How do we know that? How do you know the first beast means Babylon? Okay. Yeah. If if you want to if you want to look at what this is based off of, Google the Ishtar Gate. Mm -hmm. it, the Ishtar Gate is an actual gate of the city of Babylon that was excavated, I don't know, 100, 150 years ago, and they took it apart brick by brick, numbered them, and they shipped them to Berlin. It's in a museum in Berlin, and then they put it back together again. And it looks exactly like this. It's blue and it's gold. It's 2,500 years old and it's still spectacular. And on that gate, you find lions with eagle wings. So it's not a coincidence that this, verse, this first beast represents Babylon. Now, if I was to tell you, picture in your mind a cartoon and there's there's an eagle playing cards with a lion and a dragon and a rooster. A political cartoon. What would, what would that mean? Which one's again? An eagle and a lot playing cards with a lion and a rooster and a dragon. What? All nations playing together. Yeah. What, pull out a dollar bill and look at what, what kind of animal is on a dollar bill. An eagle. 
Eagle is, is a symbol of the United States, is it not a bald eagle? The British symbol is a lion, right? Rooster, anybody have any idea what, what nation is represented by a rooster? Australia? France. Yeah. And a dragon? If you're playing cards with a dragon, who would that be? China. China. Now, if you added a bear, it would be Russia, right? See, it's the same thing. It's representing real nations with these animals. Although last night I saw the bear on TV and he was in LA. There was a bear wandering around <laughs> Los Angeles. Oh. Eating ah. the McDonald's, no? Funny. <laughs> but unfortunately, people take that and they apply that to this. Yes. And they create their own prophecy when that is not what God has in the Bible. That's right. Because it's just a, a repeat and expansion of chapter 2. That's right. That's right. Remember, when we studied chapter 2, I said this was the skeleton that everything else hung on. So we don't have to guess what these are. I mean, there's plenty of clues about what they are. It never explains what they are. But we know what they are because Daniel chapter 2 gave us the outline. Yeah, the statue. The statue. OK, the, now what is the next, the next beast? Medo the Medo-Persians. What? And it, it was what? Bear. The bear, the lopsided bear. Why is the bear lopsided? Because one talk about it. OK. One was more powerful. That's right. Remember, it was it, the image had two arms, Medo and Persia. The bear is lopsided on one side because even though the Medes were, were prominent at first, it didn't take very long before the Persians became the, most, became the strongest half of the empire. So that's why the bear is, is lopsided. One side was stronger than the other. Now, what is the three ribs in its mouth? Yes, devour much flesh, and they did. Uh -huh. They did. Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon was the three principal places they conquered. That's right. There were three kingdoms that, that the Medo-Persians had to conquer in order to become the, the world superpower of their day. Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. Everybody has to conquer Egypt because Egypt is just, you know, always there. Yeah. Now, what was the next one? The leopard. The mutant leopard with four heads and four wings. Greece. Represents Greece, right? Greece was the bronze in the statue, so it was third. So the third one is <coughs> Greece again. Now, why, why does this leopard have four wings? It's super fast. It was the great conqueror of the known world in eight years. That's right. It's all about speed. What does the Bible, why, why do we know wings? means speed because there's a verse in the Bible and I didn't bother to look it up you can do that where it talks about Babylon being so fast it's like an eagle flying see there's that tie-in again the swiftness of the eagle that was God prophesying about Babylon so here we have a leopard with four wings what does that mean Double fast. Yeah. Alexander conquered the world in eight years on foot from Egypt to India in eight years on foot. Let's try it today. You couldn't do that today. You cannot walk even one mile. One mile. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it is almost impossible to imagine the scale of that from Egypt to India and conquering it all with 50,000 men on foot when the Persians could put a million man army on the field. It's, it boggles the mind. Right? Now, what is the significance of the four heads? Yes. When Alexander died, there he had no successor. He had no heir. And right before he died, somebody asked him, well, who is going to be, you know, who's going to take over when you're gone? He said, the strongest. And there were, he had four generals. They divided up his conquered territory among themselves. So for the rest of the, of the time of when Greece was ascendant, 
it had four divisions. It had uh, Egypt, well, I can't remember all of them, where they all were, but they had divided it all up among his four generals. Yeah, in four directions. So the leopard has four, four heads because it's all one society, all one culture, but it has four centers. Okay? Now, what comes after the leopard? This, yeah, this monster that, we, that Daniel just, he just gave up trying to describe because it was so terrible. Now, what, what, how do we know this is talking about Rome? Yes, it, they, they go in order. Yes. So but, the Iron Kingdom. Is yes. Isn't it interesting? The fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 2 is described as iron. What kind of teeth does this, does this beast have? Iron. It's no coincidence. It's a hint. Well, it's made up of all the other three as well. It makes it part of all four. Okay. Okay. So... He's, Daniel spends more time talking about this fourth beast than he does all the others put together. It's important. Why is, it, why is the fourth beast important? Because the pack of sea came after the pack of which they believe that he is God on the earth and for the Zealand's four pompous words. Okay. I can forgive sin. I can do this. I'm Jesus on the earth. I'm, you know. Okay. Then... Yeah. Yep. The worship. Right. Keep in mind the fourth beast continues to exist to this day. Yes. Remember in the in the vision of the of the statue, the iron goes all the way to the end. So this fourth beast still exists today. Also, this fourth beast is different than the other three because the other three conquered earthly territory. This beast does something different. What is it? Yes. Spirit, it doesn't just conquer people. This beast is out to conquer God. It speaks, it speaks things against the Most High. It seeks to wear out the saints of the Most High, which I think is a funny, funny way to translate it. Any, any of you ever had an old school mom that when you messed up, she said you were going to get a spanking, and what did she say? I'm going to wear you out, right? You're going to get a beating. Same kind of came, same kind of image here, right? Another aspect though is that the the little horn wants you to pray to them, worship them, you know, and not really go to worship God. Yes. Then it's really God on the earth. Then you have to be very careful. That's right. This beast is not like the others because the others were in, interested in earthly things. Mm -hmm. This beast is interested in heavenly things, spiritual, spiritual things. All right. Being the spiritual uh, things in their own uh, way, you know, because really it's not the real spiritual things. It's a powerful, a false spiritual heavenly things. Right. It's a counterfeit. Counterfeit. That's right. You know, for every good thing God has, Satan has what? Counterfeit. A counterfeit. All right. On Monday, the little horn. Now this is the part that poor Daniel was the most astounded by. Now what is, well let's read it. Look at verse 8. Oh well, no, let's see. Mm. The first line, or the last line of verse 7, we'll start there. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was a m another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, some of you may have other translations that say blasphemous stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we have to, un 
stop and ask, what does this mean to speak pompous words or to speak blasphemy? Claim authority. Claim authority? Whose authority? God's authority, okay. And do you remember when uh, the Pharisee was accusing God, that uh, accusing Jesus that Jesus is, uh, is committing blasphemy because he's forgiving sin? Yes. Which means that according with that Bible verse, uh, whoever will think that they can forgive sin, they blaspheme against God. Yes. Which means that whoever, from the religion aspect, think that they can forgive sin, they do the blasphemy against God. And we know who does. That's right. You know, it's not, it's not a uh, higher call. It's so clear, even a few years ago, was that they can forgive the, the woman which committed uh, abortions, that mm -hmm. they can forgive their sin. Well, nobody can forgive sin on the earth except God, Jesus, that's it. Yes. You cannot uh, tell to no priest, no pope, no patriarch, no pastor, nobody on the earth can forgive sin. Mm -hmm. That is blasphemy. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah, and see what has happened here is this power has put has gotten in the way between people worshiping God and God. They've gotten in the way between the two. Now, you remember as Christians, is there a temple? Do we have a high priest that we confess our sins to? Yes. Yeah, who is that? Jesus. Jesus. Do we need anybody between us and Jesus? No. 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 No, and for anybody to put themselves in that position where you have to go through them to get to Jesus, it's wrong. It's just flat wrong. Hebrew, uh, Hebrews 8 and 9, chapter 8 and 9, is so clear about the ministry of Jesus Christ in heaven and kingdom and being the high priest. Yeah. Then why you don't read the Bible, Hebrew 8 and 9, and we'll tell you clear <coughs> that you have to come to Jesus, to the high priest. You don't need nobody <coughs> between you and, and, and Jesus. Nobody. That's right. That's you right. Know. And do not accept anybody yes. that says that you have to go through them no. to get to Jesus. No. Right? That's, that's the mark of a cult, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I'm about to get myself in trouble. Okay. <laughs> Better go on. Better go on. <laughs> Quickly. Okay, let's go then. <clears throat> verse 16, or no, verse, what is that, 19. I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. So this is a violent kingdom. This is not just your run of run-of-the-mill kind of kingdom. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn, horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Now, see, everybody calls it the little horn, but it was only little at the start. It didn't take long before it was what? Bigger than the others. See, it's more powerful than the others. Calling it the little horn is just calling it the, that was at the, at the beginning. Explain the ten horns. Okay, we're about to. What are these ten horns that the, oh, by the way, how many toes ten. does a normal pair of feet have? Ten. Ten. Okay, now how many horns does this beast have? Ten. 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 What do those ten horns represent? Ten kingdoms, it says. Those, those horns are ten kingdoms that will arise out of this empire. Okay, then what are those ten, ten kingdoms? Europe. 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 That's right. Now, these ten kingdoms were ten tribes that invaded the territory of Europe back in the day and wound up taking over the whole place. And you can find their names in other places. We won't go into them quite yet because there's more of Daniel to go through don't want to tell all the secrets today y'all won't come back next week 
But these ten kingdoms ruled all of Europe. They, they took over the empire. They ruled, they, they had the empire, but they were ten distinct kingdoms. Now, what is this thing about the three of them that, that got pulled out? Well, seven of them were pretty consensual with the Catholic Church. Seven of them were. The okay. three of them were not, and they were the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Herolite. They did not like the Catholic Church, nor would they give in to its practices. And uh, so the Catholic Church made treaties with each one individually to take out one, and then the other, <laughs> and the last was the Ostrogoths. And that happened at 538. Okay. That's right. That's right. Seven of these nations were Catholic. They recognized the authority of the Pope, and they gave their allegiance to him. They, they were at his beck and call. They, he said, go invade whatever. They would go invade whoever. The other three were called the Arians. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The Arians had some non-biblical beliefs. That's a nice way of putting it. They did, I, from what I remember, they, don't, they did not believe that Jesus was God. Okay, now that's a heresy. So now you have two sides fighting and neither side is right. Theologically. Right? But these three nations that were standing up against the other seven and the Catholic Church wound up being destroyed. And the last one, like, like Callie said, was in 538 AD. That's a significant date. We'll come back to that in the future. But this little horn that sprouted up, this 11th horn, was the one that destroyed the other three. Fucked up. No existence. Gone. Wiped off the face of the earth. Gone. You know, and these were probably the three strongest of those ten kingdoms. Have you ever, what, what happens when somebody defaces a, a building today? What do we call that? Vandalize. Vandalize. Where did we get that word? The vandals. The vandals. You know what the vandals did? How they got, how that word came into to mean what it does today? They sacked Rome. They, they just about plowed Rome underground. They vandalized Rome. Now, you don't, you don't destroy Rome unless you're really powerful. Do what? I'm just saying they were tough. They were tough. That's right. But it didn't help them any. At the end, they were destroyed. All right. Now, after all this, what does Daniel see? This is on Tuesday. Okay, verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who is the Ancient of Days? God the Father. God the Father, isn't he? Right? He's on his throne, <coughs> ruling the universe. Right? And now... Notice other thrones are put in place, not just his. So what's going on here? The court was sitting and the books were open. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's back up to number nine because this is so cool. His garment was white as snow and his ha the hair of his head was like pure wool. Where have we seen somebody like this before? Isn't this what Jesus looks like in the book of Revelation? Does Jesus say that he is the express image of the Father? Yes. Well, here's proof. Okay, his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. So the Father's throne is doing a burnout here. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands upon thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Mm, this is a solemn occasion. Now, when did this happen? This has all been going in sequence, right? So when did this happen? This had to happen sometime after 
the three kingdoms were destroyed. Okay, it doesn't give us a time, but it gives us a sequence. That's important. We'll see that here in just a minute. Uh, let's see, go down to verse 26. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion. This is talking about that fourth beast. To consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under, this, under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. All right. Now, let's stop and think about this because this is important. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a sequence here in Daniel chapter 7. What is the sequence? Let's go back to the very beginning. We have the lion with eagle's wings. We have the lopsided bear. Okay, we have the mutant leopard. We have the, the monster. And then we have ten divisions of the monster, ten horns. Three horns are destroyed by the, the eleventh horn that comes up. And then we see what? The judgment. judgment. And where is the judgment? Where is this going on? In heaven. Okay, now it's important that we have this in our minds. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the division of Rome, the rise of the papacy, and judgment in heaven. Now the reason I'm harping on this is because there are people in the Seventh-day Adventist church who will tell you that you cannot that Daniel chapter 7 does not show judgment in heaven. But where? It, it just doesn't show. There is no judgment in, in Daniel chapter 7. It's so, so clear. The books are open. <laughs> well, I know. The, the scene is in heaven. The, the, the God, let, this thing that you don't even think that it's God, but an ancient of the days is sitting on the throne. Well, sitting on the throne and you open the books, and the angels are there, what can happen? Well, what else Why could be going on? Would you open the books? Yeah. You know, if it's not the judgment or see what's, what's in the books. The court was seated and the books were open. Yeah. But there is a heresy in our church that says that there was no, there is no such thing as a pre-advent judgment. Mm -hmm. They also don't believe in the 2300, the 1844, and just that it's a rolling, of goes on and on. Yeah. Well, so it's important. It, does anybody not see this can I mean once you see it you can't unsee it but does it is anybody confused well Jesus because, told that I'm coming with my reward right which means that something has to happen before Jesus comes in order for him to come with eternal life or you lose you will have the, the condemnation which means that something has to happen in heaven in order for him to come with a reward and if the books are open and the seats are sitting, what can happen in order for Jesus to come with his reward? Right. It has to be a judgment, and that is the pre-advent judgment. Yes. It's the investigative judgment before Jesus comes second time. Yes. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, does it show Jesus coming back to earth? No. No. He's taken to the Father. No, he's taken to the Father. Right? The Father is seated on His throne, right? Yeah. His, his throne's got the burning wheels. He's doing a burnout, yeah. right? And then what happens? Don't take my word for it. Let's read it. Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Is He coming to the earth, though, with the clouds of heaven? Doesn't it say Jesus is going to come to the earth, yeah. come back with the clouds of heaven? Is that what this is talking about? No. no, keep going. One like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all people, nations, languages, etc. should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Okay? Now what, what is being depicted here in these verses? What is this telling us? Yes. In, in the sanctuary service, there was two apartments. Yes. 
the holy place and the most holy place. What did the most holy place have in it? The ark. The ark of the covenant. It's the only thing in there. And it had two angels on the lid facing each other. And what was between them? The Shekinah glory. The, the presence of God on earth. Which represents his throne in heaven. Now, how many people got to just mosey in there, you know, whenever they felt like it? The high priest once per year. Once, one time, the high priest got to go in there by himself. The only human being allowed to go in there. The only one on planet earth that could go in there. He wasn't sure. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it, he didn't know whether he was going to be accepted when he went in there. <coughs> but what does that represent? Jesus, going to do. Jesus Christ, who is the only person that has ever lived on planet Earth who is worthy to go before the Father and plead our case. This is a representation of of the Day of Atonement in Heaven. They have brought Jesus, the sacrifice, who is also the High Priest, mm -hmm. to the Father to present Him mm -hmm. to the Father to see if the Father will accept Him. Oh, wow. Right? Accept. And we see that in Revelation as well, that parallel, that there's a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world and there's a book that needs to be opened. And they bring Him before. And this is the... the uh, thrones were set. The, God himself was sitting there and then and then he comes. The Lord yeah. comes, Jesus comes and the book was opened. That's right. I got to see it all. That's like right. Like Daniel's seeing it right now. So it's really awesome. But yeah. if you don't believe that this happened before Jesus come, where do you put it? I, I don't know. Because then you have to delete it. Then. it you, you have to throw out everything yes. that we believe yeah, well, as a church. And they well, do. But, but not only that, but what do you do with these Bible verses? You have to throw them away because when will be fulfilled then? Yeah. If you don't believe in the pre-advent, in the judgment before Jesus come, if you don't believe, where do you put it then? That's right. I have no idea. But you see, that's, a, that's why I'm harping on this, is because this is a heresy in our church. We need to understand what the Bible is telling us here. And we need to be clear on it. Because you may run across somebody who will challenge you. Oh, there's no such thing as a, as a pre-advent judgment, especially in Daniel chapter 7. And you're just going, excuse me. You know, you can't unsee it once you've seen it. Okay, now, the high priest went into the most holy place what day? When is Jesus going before the Father here? The Day of Atonement. Judgment Day, because the books are open. The court is seated and the books are open. Right? This is judgment in heaven. Right here. Now we'll skip ahead a little bit. When did that happen? 1844. 1844. When he moved from the holy place to the most holy place in the ministry, which means that uh, the day of atonement is now. That's right. This is where he this is what he's doing right now. So if you want to if you want to know, yeah, I don't wonder what Jesus is doing this morning. Well, here it is. Yeah. Here it is, right here. The sanctuary cleans Daniel eight fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You know, uh, uh, Mark, if you get rid of these Bible verses, how do you connect it with Daniel eight fourteen? How do you connect with Hebrew eight nine, where it tells that Jesus is from? holy place to the most holy place before the Father. I don't what know. What do you do with those Bible verses? Because you don't get rid of only these Bible verses. You have other Bible verses which connects with this. I know. You get in trouble. It, that's, I think the problem, you now this is just my opinion, and you know what that's worth, <laughs> but in my opinion, they have skipped the first six, verse, first six books, chapters Daniel. of Daniel chapter. Of, yeah. of the book of Daniel because they have failed to understand yeah. all of this prophecy stuff is about the result of our relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. and that's what the first six chapters of Daniel is yeah. laying that foundation for us yeah. 
And then if you see, if you just jump into Daniel chapter 7, cold, this is what happens to you. You will be confused. For this reason, we have a lot of wrong prophecies or understanding of the prophecies because they don't have the understanding of the six chapters. They don't really understand God. That's right. You cannot understand prophecy given by God if you don't understand God. If you don't understand what his motive is, if you don't understand what's driving him to do all of this, then the prophecy is not going to do you any good. No. Right? You're not going to understand any of it. Mark, but we've got to keep this in perspective because there's some Adventists that don't believe in creation either. That's true. The Bible, so there's that's true. a group somewhere that's not going to agree with it. Whatever doctrine, and let's say there's 28 doctrines. You show me 28 doctrines, I can find you somebody that doesn't believe in something. Any or all of them. The point is, what do you believe? For, forget about them for a minute. Let's ask the, the hard question. What is it that you believe about God? What do you believe you learned in the first six chapters of Daniel? What does God say to you in the Bible, in prophecy. Forget, you know, people can be confused. They, they may not understand for some reason. And that's fine. That's, that's different. This, what we're talking about, is deliberate. This is a deliberate not understanding. It's a rejection. But do you think it's because we choose whatever Bible verse to believe and uh, we put them, well, this does not really fit here, let me throw it away. And we don't really understand where it tells if you take out or you add to this book, mm -hmm. you know, we don't really believe that Bible verse because if we did believe, we should not take out and we should not add. Yeah, it's being careless. You know, there's a Bible verse that says <laughs> Judas went out of the city and hung himself. Yeah. There's also a Bible verse that says go and do that likewise. <laughs> I mean, are those both of those verses are in the Bible, are they not? Yes, they are. So, what are you going to do with that? Now, see, it, it, it goes back to how are you interpreting the Bible, and how you interpret the Bible depends on how do you see God. Well, I've learned one thing, Margaret. As I study the Bible, the Bible, let the Bible be the teacher. The biggest thing people hate is it demands change. And that's the problem. Yes. That's right. So you will make anything fit your agenda so you don't have to make a change. Yes. That's true. That's right. That's right. The Bible gets all up in your business. It's your business. It, every day, if you crack that thing open, it's going to get messy. And we have such <coughs> uh, preconceptive ideas, too. The way we were raised, the way we yeah. think things around us or whatever. Will influence our. Um, hmm? I say it'll change all that. I know, but if you if you are strong in your pre preconceptive ideas, guess what? You will not understand the Bible. For this reason, when you come to read the Bible, you have to pray, Lord, put my thinking in the dust, put yeah. my beliefs in the dust. Mm -hmm. Whatever I believe is not important. It's what is in the Bible. It's important. important. But many times we approach the Bible. I will prove it from the Bible what I believe. Forget about it. You have to believe what Jesus believes and what is in the Bible. But yeah. many times we bring our beliefs in the Bible and that is wrong. Yeah. I know what I believe. I'm going to yeah. prove it from yeah. not what does the Bible say about this yeah. subject. Yeah. yeah. We, we've all heard stories like on three again or something where somebody comes and says, I was going to, I was going to get my sister away from that cult and they read the Bible and God spoke to them. Yeah. I think James Rafferty was like, yeah. this was wrong. The most dangerous thing you can do ever is read the Bible. By the way, we have a Bible reading class at 3 o'clock this afternoon down in the, down in the youth and in, in, uh, in the community center. You want to turn your life upside down, you all show up down there. We've got free Bibles if you've got the nerve to read them. <laughs> Shameless plug there. Put it on the line. Yeah. Yeah. Did you? Oh, okay. 
Yeah. The, the most dangerous thing you can do in your life is read the Bible. Yeah. And the most wonderful. And the most wonderful, yeah. All right. Thursday. All this, all these weird animals. Let's get to the good part. Let's see. Verse 17. Those great beasts which are for, this is the angel telling Daniel the interpretation, are four kings which arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And then, verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. Now, one of these verses said that Jesus gets the kingdom. Another verse says the people get the kingdom. So which is it? Both. Both. That's right. Jesus is one of the... Is He not one of us now? Yeah. He has won the kingdom for us. Right? He is, he is one of us now. That's right. That's right. And it's not just the kingdom to come. It's the kingdom here and now. So... You can be part of that kingdom now. In fact, you, sh you should be part of the kingdom now and not wait till later. Later will be too late. Right? Now, this is going to be kind of hard for people to, to swallow, but if you are a citizen of his kingdom, can you be a citizen here on earth? Let me say it again. If you are a citizen of God's kingdom, can you be a citizen of any kingdom on earth? No? Okay, I have some no's over here. Anybody else? No, we have a no over here. From any... part of the world, explain that question. <laughs> okay. Is there no dual citizenship? Do what? Is there no dual citizenship? <laughs> ah, dual citizenship. That's a good question. No. Okay. <laughs> no, there is not a dual citizenship. So see, this is, this is we're going to study some of this later in the quarter. You have to decide now if you're going to be a traitor or a patriot. You, because you're going to be one, you're going to be both. You will either be a traitor to the kingdom of heaven and a patriot to the kingdoms of this world or you will be a traitor here and a patriot there those are the that's the that's the question everybody has to answer that who has your allegiance which kingdom do you belong to which kingdom do you love enough to give your life for. Because the day is coming when you can't have dual citizenship. You're going to have to decide one way or the other. That's when we see the mark of the beast. Now, it's not a very popular thing to be saying, but I said it because it's the truth. But, Mark, if we die now, we don't have the mark of the beast. For this reason, I think we have to take the decision to stand for the kingdom of God today. Mm -hmm. Because when we die, we rest in the ground. That's it. Then our, our, uh, our um, that we are for the kingdom or not, is today the decision. Because we never know if we have another day to take the decision for God's kingdom. That's right. Which means that we can lose God's kingdom today because we don't take the decision for Jesus in every aspect of our life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier today to compromise. It's easier today to still believe in what you believe. 
But how about if you die? What will happen? Yeah. Are you sure you have God's kingdom? You resurrect in the first resurrection, resurrection or in the second one? Yeah. And I think today we have to stop to pray with the love for Jesus or no love for Jesus. Take a stand for Jesus or against him. Mm -hmm. Don't play because I think when you play is the most dangerous. Yeah. And we do that. We still do that and that is Jesus Christ in heaven for us because today we are still playing the game. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I will love you a little bit, but this one I want to do. Yep. No. Yep. And guess what? We will deserve the salvation being in the church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Being in the church doesn't... I, ooh, I almost said it doesn't do you any good. That's not quite... That's not right. No, yeah. that's not right. But... It doesn't save you. <laughs> right. What's, what saves you? Connection with Jesus. Yeah. All of that first six chapter of Daniel stuff. And do what Jesus tells you to do. Yeah. Because sometimes we, we are called, we ease our conscience. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Well, guess what? Satan loves Jesus too, but does not do the work of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then... Just the love is cheap. I love pizza. I love my dog. I love my chair. I love my coat. I love everything. <laughs> is that true love for Jesus? Does Jesus have allegiance? Your action, your words, your thoughts is belonging to Jesus. That is the question. Yeah. Yeah. Does everybody know the history of the Roman Empire? What are they teaching in school these days? Are they not teaching you the important stuff? <laughs> okay, then here's the Cliff Notes version for the Roman Empire. The Romans defeated the Carthaginians, finally, and they became rulers of the whole Mediterranean world, all, the whole world that the Jews knew about back then. Now, what's important was Rome was a republic. What is a republic? A republic is where you vote representatives to represent you in the government. Right? So the ordinary people of Rome had representation in the government. Until society got to be so bad, so wicked, so treacherous, that the people demanded and they used the D word. They demanded a dictator. And that's how they got the Caesars. They wanted somebody in charge who would bring order out of the chaos, someone who would protect their rights, someone who would do right by the kingdom, and they ended up with Caesar and then they had no rights, except what Caesar told them. They had no freedom. They had no representation. Now, in 538, well, it was before 538, but in 538, there was a new representation of Caesar that ruled the empire. And who was that? The Pope. Just took over Pontifex Maximus. Pope. That's right. That's right. All the titles for the Pope were titles that they gave to Caesar. Pontifex Maximus. You know what that means? The literal Latin means what? The master bridge builder. Because Caesar caused, you know, what held the Roman Empire together? Roads. All roads lead to Rome. Yeah. That's not just a saying. That's true. So when they had to build a bridge, Caesar paid for it. He made the bridge be built so the roads could continue to Rome. That's what that, those words mean. They have been taken over by the papacy. That's why he's called the pontiff. 
all of the rights, the responsibilities, and the powers of Caesar belong to the Pope. Do they not? Caesar was worshipped as a god. Does the Pope say he has divine powers? Yes. Now, at the end of time, and if you study in the book of Revelation chapter 13, there is a beast that sprouts up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. At the end of time, there is another republic where the people have representation in the government. But their time will come when society is so bad, so wicked, even the wicked people are not going to stand for it. And there will come a time when they will demand, the people will demand someone to rule over them. And not just in everyday things, rule over them in religious things too. These two republics are what? The first republic was... And what is the second? The United States of America. Now that's an unpopular thing for me to have to stand here and tell you. But that's what this book says. But after it's all said and done, what happens? These things must come to pass because what? Because Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. So. Yeah, I think when it comes to that 538, understanding that time, times, and dividing of time, understanding the prophecy, that that is the same as what <coughs> other prophecy. The same number that we have in Revelation, it is the 42 months, which is also called the... Well, 60. And if we don't know that, we will not put that in right context. It's part of the 2300. The 1260 is the same when it talks about in Daniel chapter 25 that it will be a, a time times and dividing of time. That is three and a half years. Mm -hmm. That is 42 months, which is the 1260 days. Yep. That is how long that they were given that time slot from 538 to 1798. And then the deadly wound was given. So I think, it, I think a lot of us don't even remember that. <laughs> you're, you're, you're stealing all my thunder for the next two weeks. What, what are you no, doing? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you tell somebody what's a 1260, they'll look at you and they go, I have no idea. Yeah. And that's Adventist. And, and we're going to get into that because that's, that's what's great about this quarter's lessons. Is we're, we're plowing that fundamental stuff right. that we all need to understand. Because what's interesting about that is the 2,300 day prophecy, every Protestant or every other church, Catholic, whatever, they will take it, even our church, and they will misapply it yeah. to different times. But the 1260, the Catholic church cannot deny it. They yeah. will even tell you, you're right. Yeah. I mean, you're right. It was from 538 to 1798. Yeah. If anybody has a problem with the Bible being accurate, just study the middle men and study this right here. It tells you exactly what was going to happen back then until today. Yeah. In fact, the next two chapters, 8 and 9, is going to scorch the earth with, with prophecy. It will be impossible. It will be impossible for you not to understand that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church. Amen. After we get through with them, it will be impossible. You cannot unsee it. Now that's... I'm hanging my neck out here saying that. I hope I'm up to teaching it <laughs> where, where you can understand it. But it's true. You cannot, you cannot read this with a genuine heart and come to another conclusion. That's what brought me in. That turns it. <laughs> yeah. You cannot see your relationship with Jesus Christ if you don't know his word. Yeah. And that is the truth because a lot of people say, I know the Lord, I love the Lord, and all that. I believe, all you have to do is believe and be saved. Well, there's going to be a lot of people that say, Lord, Lord, and he says, I know you not. And why? Because you don't know my word. Yeah. You did not practice you, the things that I I don't believe. know you. Yep, I don't Man, know what, a, what a terrible thing to have Satan, said to you. Satan believes his word. Yep. 
Yeah. But he doesn't practice it. Yeah. That's it. That is the difference. Yeah, he has, he has broken off the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But Mark, back to you. You were talking about America and prophecy and everything. And sometimes we, being here in America for so long time, we think, well, never would happen here. You know, the religion and liberty never will happen. Well, look around you today and you know, if they do it to the big people, who, who you are not to be done to you. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. I'm looking to the politics, how they see this, that one sees that, that, you know, they play each other. Who you are not to play you? You are nobody. Yeah. And they will play you in the end, end time. Yeah. No question. Yeah. Yeah, there is, there is no... Well, there's there's no defense mm -mm. in this world. No. They can accuse you of anything, and they can plan all kinds of proofs that you are wrong. They can do it. Yeah. Any time they can prove you are wrong. Yep. Whew. Well, enough of that. Yeah. I know, and there's so much more we could talk about, I, too. It's so I much. know. We, it, there was just so much. Mm -hmm. But... Sorry, got to go on. <laughs> Do what? My turn. Yeah, he's he's over there wanting to preach or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, any questions? Is it clear? Is what I went over clear enough? Yes. Okay. And and don't if if it's not clear, don't don't hesitate to speak up because go personally and tell him. Yeah, I mean, come ask me. Yeah. Well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful, dear Lord, for this word that you've given us and, and this study we've had this morning. And we just praise and thank you for loving each one of us enough to put this in the Bible so that we can have assurance of who you are and that you're on our side. We just praise and thank you for that. And we just ask for the Holy Spirit to be in our lives so that we can be so that we can be worthy of of the trust that you've given to us. And Lord, we just ask for you to be with us in the rest of our service. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.